Clyde River Baptist Church, we have a great, much greater purpose than our local fellowship. We do the ministry of the church of the living God. If this is true, and it is true, then what flows from this is that it is critical that every member of the body must know what his or her gifts are. That's why soon after our arrival here, a few years ago, we took quite a few weeks to study our spiritual gifts because it's really important that I can tell you what my spiritual gifts are for several reasons. I must be able to name my gift or gifts, I must be able to intentionally use them, put them into practice, and I need to evaluate them as I go along in ministry. Remember, if you are a Christian, you are a minister. If you don't like it, well then, then you're not a Christian, because it's just, it's all a package deal. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says, Romans 12, verse 3, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you according to the measure of faith that God has assigned to you. Well, I heard that for many years and Maybe I can't blame the ministers that I heard because maybe I didn't interpret it correctly or, or maybe I wasn't listening. But what I've heard many people say over the years is that the, the measure of faith that has been given to you, so God gives some people a lot of faith and then he gives other people just a little bit of faith. So if you have a lot of faith, you can go out and do great things for him. And if you just have a little faith where well, you're kind of off the hook, you can just kind of not do, do much and that's okay. Well, that's not what the scripture's saying at all. If we knew our Greek, we would say that according to the measure of faith, it's not in the quantity of faith. It's the distributing of the faith. You see, God distributes faith to every single one of his children. Every single one, it's a given that they will be given faith. But now just for a a second, even if that was true, which it's not, Faith as small as a grain of mustard seed, as tiny as faith as you can possibly have if it is placed in Jesus, then Jesus himself said that is more than enough. Even if your faith is minuscule, if your faith is not in your gifts or your talents or your wealth or your health or your popularity, but if your faith is in the living Jesus, then it is more than enough. But we are told that faith is distributed to every single Christian We should never make the mistake of comparing ourselves or our gifts with others. We're making a big mistake. Rather, we must consider what I am doing with the gifts that God has given me. And if you think you don't have any, you better think again and better think hard and fast. Because every believer has been given spiritual gifts. We must share our joys and our sorrows and encourage one another and challenge each other. Our gifts matter to everyone in the body. I need you, and you need me. And we would be wise to really process that and own that. This might be maybe not the greatest example, but it does come to mind. When COVID shut us down, then I heard from Ozzy, an email or phone call, and I heard from Fern Communications. I think you and Lyane, we need to... You know, you need to do something as far as uh, Facebook or YouTube. And I thought, oh, no, there's that's one thing that I don't think is going to happen in our life because we are so far from technology. I thought, if you want to do it, then you just help yourself, Ozzy and Fern, you go right to town. But they, in a very loving way, did not give up. (laughs) They would kindly remind and encourage. And then the Lord starts to work. And when the Lord works, then if we're a Christian, we know we, we have to follow through. And I thought, well, we'll take the next step. Here we go. And the first two steps weren't too great for those of you who listened. But we were being faithful. And that's all God requires. That's all he asks. He doesn't ask for perfection or, or an incredible standard. All he asks is for us to take the next step that we know. Only one step. But take that one step. And he'll make it clearer as we go along. So thank you, my sister and my brother. We owe you a great debt of gratitude. Well, we all have gifts. And it is critical that we know what our gifts are and we put them into practice. Why? Because every gift, every spiritual gift is of great importance to the functioning of the body. Some gifts are more obvious. Some people are in 
public eye more often, showing their gifts or their talents. But what about the treasurer or the secretary or the custodian or that man or woman who goes to visit others regularly in the name of our Lord and Savior? Wonderful, tremendous gifts that must be put into practice. We don't see them as equal, maybe. I hope you do. Many of us don't. We see, well, that's a really great gift and that's not such an important gift. Maybe you don't think of it that way. And if you do, that's wonderful. But many people do look at something being more important than another. Well, the scriptures deal with that one. The Apostle Paul and his church to Corinth, his first letter to Corinth, 1 Corinthians 13, and you know it so well. He made it crystal clear that every single gift you can have is of lesser value than something called L-O-V-E. Every single spiritual gift we have, it must be built on love. Otherwise, we do not get to first base. He said this, if I could speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump and it jumps, but I don't love, I am nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor, and even if I go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, and if I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm nothing, nothing, nothing without love. Our gifts, therefore, must be primarily focused, first of all, on glorifying the one who saved us. Second of all, we need to be thinking about our brothers and sisters, how our gifts can be used to build up one another in this room today. What can I do that will strengthen your faith? Sometimes I need to challenge you like some have done. I gave you an example. We need to do that always, the foundation always. If love's not there, I've often said, go home and sleep it off. If love is not in the phrase, if love is not in my heart, if love is not my motivation, then I need to not even attempt anything until love consumes me. And then the third one, we use our gifts for reaching the lost, for Jesus. I don't know if you've noticed, but the world is lost and dying and going to hell. And we need to not sleep. We need to be wide awake with ears, wide open listening and our eyes seeing. Well, Paul used an amazing and appropriate analogy, quite a comparison to the human body. I'm going to read much of it there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 12. Paul said, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with, with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, whatever it might be, we're all given the one spirit to drink, the Holy Spirit. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many parts. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. They could say that, but it doesn't make it true. You see, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. You see, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. 
Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. Have you ever had a corn on your little toe? Anyone here ever had that? No, I'm the only one. Well, that's fine. I'm happy for you. I don't know, three or four winters ago, I have no idea how I got that, but I got a corn on my little toe. And I told two teachers in school one day, I don't know if I can get through the day, and they said, well, just kind of get a Band-Aid or something. So I tried, tried everything I could, and I got through the day, and then I would soak it at night, and, and we were planning a trip to Florida, and I thought, well, this... You know, I'll wear the right footwear. And so, so one day in particular, I bought a pair of flip-flops down there just so I could try and enjoy uh, our time together. So we were walking along, and I was going as fast as I could, but Lyene looked back, and I was maybe a quarter of a mile behind her because I, every step was excruciating. And that was my little toe, my little toe. And it was, it was hindering my whole trip. It did fall off a few days later and enjoyed the rest of the time, but not the toe didn't fall off, but the corn. <laughs> I ask you, have you ever had a bad knee or a bad hip or an eye problem or a toothache? You know that the whole body suffers when one body part is not able to do its part. The whole body suffers. My, my, our creator is a genius, right? He made our bodies. They are fearfully and wonderfully made, but he also created the body of Christ on earth, the church, and we are fearfully and wonderfully made. No, no, the custodian, the treasurer, the song leader, the one who visits, the one who greets, the trustees who make practical decisions, if their gifts are based upon love, honoring Jesus first, ministering to the body second, and reaching the loss for Christ third, we, our body is functioning very, very well. Spiritual gifts are a part of Jesus' work. Our gifts are given by Jesus as a result of his crucifixion and his resurrection. Many Christians maybe don't see that clearly. I don't know. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, and I read it earlier. He, it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Paul was quoting from Psalm 68. You see... Psalm 68 was a triumphant march for the armies of Israel returning from a war in which Yahweh, God, had given them victory. The Jews marched back to Jerusalem with their captives, with their prisoners, and with much bounty. Anything that the conquered people surrendered to them was included in the temple's treasury in Jerusalem. It's no wonder the apostle Paul compared that triumphal march with all the gifts to Jesus ascending back to the Father and then Jesus establishing his body on earth, the church, and distributing his rewards with everyone who follows him, it's no wonder we all have spiritual gifts. We are taking part in what Jesus planned for his church to accomplish. We celebrate what Jesus accomplished when he birthed the church. We sang about it this morning. It is the hope of all the world. I rather we sang she because the church is referred to as the bride of Christ, not an it, but the author wrote it. I have seen a mystery, the hopes of prayer and prophecy, and rising from all peoples, here she comes. She's rescued, ransomed, lifted up, crowned with mercy, clothed with hope, the object of all heaven's love. She comes. Who is she? She is the church, the hope of all the world. And here I pledge my heart and hand, I cannot turn away. I was telling us, we went out for lunch, a few of us, last Sunday. It's a good thing to do. If you want to go to lunch, just let me know because I love to eat. So we, and, and I'll pay. Don't worry. Because so, we need to be generous in the body, remember. It's one of our, one of our essential parts to the body. Um, I was telling some, some of our fellowship last week, I can remember cleaning our back deck. And I was so disgusted with my church. This is... 30, 30 years ago, thereabouts, 30 years ago. I was a young Christian, had a lot to learn. I still have tons to learn, but I've learned more in 30 years than I knew previously, obviously. And I was so disgusted with, with something I saw in our church. Not with those who weren't saying they were Christians. No, they never disgust me. It's those that say they love Jesus and act like they don't even know who Jesus is. And I was grossed out. And I remember thinking, as I was shoveling our back deck off, I'll never go back to church again. I am so disgusted. 
I wasn't disgusted with the Lord. His love was gracious to me, but I was disgusted with what I saw. But you see, the church, I couldn't, what, what does the phrase go? It is the church, the hope of all the world, and here I pledge my heart. And I cannot turn away. I tried, but I couldn't leave the, the body of Christ. And the Lord directed us to another church. It's not wrong. I make this clear. It's not wrong to leave a fellowship. If we leave just because we're mad at somebody, then that's not good. But, but, and, I, and the Lord helped me work through my, my anger. We, we moved to a, a different church and a different denomination. That was probably part of us becoming Baptist along the way, maybe. Who knows? But we left the denomination in which I grew up in, which my mother and father were members of, in which we were members of, and, and we went to another church, and it was through that new pastor that we adopted our son and brought him home. And my mother said to me, Garth, do you, th do you realize if you hadn't have left our church and went to that church, you wouldn't have your baby boy? No, if you find that I'm not t preaching the truth, then you should lovingly challenge me and the church leadership for sure. And if, and if I refuse to, to acknowledge and, 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 and obsess with the word of God and honor him, then you would, and if you can't get anywhere with the church leadership, then as a Christian, it, you are compelled, compelled to find a church that will be real and teach the word of God. No, it's not wrong. Hope you don't, but uh, I'd rather work, work through any issues that we have. But, we need, to, um, we need to love and, and uh, embrace and, and adore the church of the living God. Why, you might ask? Because our fellowship is like no other on earth. You see, there's no other religion on earth. Take this home and work through it. There's no other religion on earth but faith in Jesus. I'm not talking about nominal Christianity. Just being religious is so dangerous. Because you think you're better than other people. And the minute you think you're better than someone else, you're apart from Jesus. But I'm talking about real Christianity. Real Christianity says that every member, every single member in our faith shares the power of God, the Holy Spirit, in such a way that every single one of us has an identifiable gift and ministry which is just as important as everyone else. Is it wrong for Christians to have low self-esteem? Yeah, I think it is. If you're a Christian for a, very, for, for a period of time, for years, and if you're still going around with, with thinking, I'm poor, you know, I'm not as good as them, and I can't do this, and it's pride, it's pride. That's what it is. You say, pride? How could that be pride? I think I'm a nobody. Yeah, you're concentrating on you. You don't do it very well, so get over it and get busy. It's, it's astounding how that we can just be obsessed with that we're so good or that we're so inferior and both would be so equally wrong. You see, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, excuse me, Paul said, Peter said, when he finally realized, and it took him a while to realize, that Gentiles could become followers of Jesus. You might think, well, what's so amazing about that? It was astounding because the Jewish faith believed that they were the only the only ones on earth that Yahweh loved. And Jesus comes as a Jew and then he says that anyone who follows me can be right with Yahweh. Peter said in Acts 10.34, Peter said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. I love it. He accepts men and women from every nation, language and creed who fear him and do what is right. Every believer... Only you can answer if that's you. I can't. But every believer offers a life of full-time service to God. You might say, well, I'm not a pastor. No, maybe you're not a pastor. But if you're a Christian, you are a full-time minister. The Christian's primary concern is his or her service to Jesus. As I said, God's plan is to redeem the world through his church. The church is the hope of all the world. And, the church, and you and I are the only Bible that many people will ever read in their entire lifetime. And the Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And I ask you, what kind of Bible are you printing out today? What words am I speaking through my day-to-day -day decisions, my choices, my actions, my behaviors, my attitudes, and yes, my words too? And here's the best barometer that I know of. 
and I hope you'll own this one too. If every member in our body contributed as much to the work of the church as me, not someone else, just me, how healthy is our body? You see, God always has had a people. And with the coming of Jesus, we have the church. And the church will exist to eternity. His bride, the church. And the church will flourish. The Bible says the gates of hell will could never, never destroy the church. The church may become smaller through history and pure, but small isn't necessarily wrong. The church will flourish and strengthen with you or the church will flourish and strengthen without you. I want to do my part to you. We're going to sing a hymn before we gather at the Lord's table. Hope you'll consider the words as we sing together. King of my life, I crown you now. All the glory is yours. But it's so easy to forget how we got to this place. His thorn-crowned brow. So lead us, Lord, to Calvary. In just a few minutes, we're going to gather. Well, we'll, we'll follow our regulations and we'll come forward and, and receive. Each one will come forward and just receive the elements and take them back to your seat before we partake together. But we'll give you instructions in a few minutes. So could we stand, everyone, and sing the words of this, this hymn? Our prayer, everyone. No.